All right, guys, let's give a shout out to all you webinar attendees. I'm really excited about today's webinar, which is all about pursuing a career in concept art and matte painting. Uh, my name is Frank Cordero. I'm the host of today's webinar. For those who don't know me, I'm already uh, a former uh, Disney animator, former concept and art director at Electronic Arts, uh, freelance 2D, 3D artist, and currently doing content marketing for CG Master Academy. Today's webinar is sponsored by CG Master Academy. All right, CG Master Academy is the leader in online digital arts education in art, visual effects, games, and now animation. CGMA always strives to offer artists the highest quality education through the most affordable, accessible, and relevant courses in the world. As a team founded by artists, for artists, we're committed to enabling you to become a better artist by learning from the industry's best. And speaking of the industry's best, holy smokes, we have an amazing guy here. Um, Igor, are you excited to be a part of us? Uh, you know, I know I got you up early. <laughs> no, no, no worries. I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm super excited. And thank you very much for having me. It's a well, great pleasure, yeah. So we're going to be doing, um, uh, for the next uh, hour plus, we're going to be doing Pursuing a Career in Concept Art and Matte Painting for Production with Igor Startson. Uh, who's one of our CGMA superstars. Just to give you a little bit more of an idea of uh, Igor's background, uh, he is a lead concept artist and matte painter environment artist working in the film and video game industries. Uh, he's worked for many VFX companies like Warner Brothers, Disney, Marvel, Legendary, 20th Century Fox, Method, MPC, Digic Pictures, Naughty Dog, Pixamundo. I mean, it runs the gamut. Uh, credits include... Uh, Godzilla, King of the Monsters, Black Panther, Thor Ragnarok. Oh, my God, my, my tongue is getting tired. Justice League, Guardians of the Galaxy, Assassin's Creed, Game of Thrones, Call of Duty, Final Fantasy, Jersey Boys, and there's definitely a bunch of et cetera's on that list as well. Um, he's also featured in several books, including Ballistic Publishing's D. Artiste, Map Painting 3, and uh, believe it or not, um, this guy used to be a former hip hop music creator. Holy smokes. Uh, this guy is versatile and multi-talented to say the least. So anyway, I was so excited. Maybe you can give us a little bit more of a window about that part of your life. Um, Cause that's really interesting to me. Um, but anyway, we're going to go straight into the idea of Q and a, cause um, we've got a lot of questions for Igor and he was so great uh, to kind of, you know, allow for that question and answer Part to happen. If we happen to see any questions come up uh, from the Q&A um, or from the chat, we'll try to pull those into the presentation as well. All right, Igor. So I uh, wanted to get started. Um, so what is being an artist trained in Russia like? Uh, the painting schools and museums are reputed to be some of the best in the world. And, um, you know, I would love to hear a little bit more about that. Um, so go for it, man. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, awesome, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's definitely true. Like, if, you know, the reputation that Russian school, uh, Russian schools rather have is like, you know, it's very big on art, you know, like, and I think the main focus and the main reason why they are so, you know, so good and so great is because they really, they really try to teach you how to, you know, paint and how to draw and how to focus and master fundamentals, which is, you know, like a really, really big thing. And uh, so you spend hours, days, maybe months and years to really master it, to get like a good uh, understanding. And, you know, obviously later on, you can use it for whatever type of work you have, whether it's a creature, maybe, you know, design environments and things like that. And I guess what, you know, how, also, this can be, you know, relevant as well, that especially these days, I guess, you know, because so many things, you know, coming out from every direction as far as, you know, like uh, what to use, what software and whatnot. But a lot of people tend to forget that the fundamentals is such a core aspect of all of this. Right. And everyone wants to know, you know, let's say w what software you used when the when your artwork looks great but nobody cares what software you, you use if your artwork doesn't look you know that good and that's that basically you know comes down to the point of knowing those fundamentals and knowing how to use them and i think once again 
if you spend time, whether it's, you know, in Russian art school, if you can, great. Or if you spend time on your own kind of mastering that, I think that's, that's, that's a very, very beneficial on the long run. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, speaking of, you know, Russian schools and museums, I think I was, I was fortunate enough in a sense that, you, you know, being like born and raised here. So I had, you know, sort of access and, uh, to all of that art to kind of see it in person and be, be, being able to go to a museum many times and study and explore it. That was just like mind blowing to see not just the reproduction itself, but the actual painting. And they're basically, you know, like study it for real because we, I mean, what, what all of us do, or, you know, would do we would go like online if we if we search for a certain artist or a certain work and you know try to find like his paintings but the danger of it like i mean yeah you can find like you know really good mm -hmm. productions maybe and things like that but the danger is that you know photograph that you can see online will never really show you the true you know values like the value range through colors and things like that so it's always or most often uh <clears throat> It's going to be like distorted either too dark or too light or too saturated and things like that and really the best way is obviously once again to go to a museum if you have a chance and when you take a photo yourself always try to also take a close-up of that painting so the whole thing just to kind of have it and also go like close to the painting and take a close-up so that way you can study you know brush work and it also going to give you like a true authentic you know colors that the painting actually has so that, that that would be like a good tip that I learned from uh, one of my kind of mentors that I had a chance to study with. Was art part of the conversation in your family? Did you have a parent, mm -hmm. you know, mother, sister, uh, brothers, or, you know, people in your family who are in the arts or aware of the arts and encourage mm -hmm. that? Or were you kind of like uh, alone in your uh, pursuits? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Well, I mean, as far as my family goes, I would say, you know, my dad, when when he was younger, he did like lots of drawings, but those would be, you know, predominantly for some engineer, uh, some engineering, you know, aspects like if, if he needs to like kind of build certain thing. Uh, so he would probably do, you know, like bunch of drawings from, you know, different angles to figure out. Yeah. You know, measurements and things like that but he would very he would be very precise and you know he would spend time to really it's like basically you know when we do our uh when you kind of before diving into a complexity of like full you know for real painting you kind of want to know you know the plan like how, how you want to tackle it what what the composition is going to be like with the color palette and things like that so he would do the same things but with his kind of drawings before you know going <clears throat> into full pr production of that specific uh, thing would kind of come up with a game plan. So uh, yeah, that was, I think that was part of he, his artistic journey, so, so, so to speak. But for me, for me, I think, I, I mean, it's kind of, you know, the same story as everyone says, like, you know, I, I've been painting and drawing since I was a child and th things like that. But for me, it's similar, but I kind of, I mean, still up to this day these days i'm a fan of you know terminator terminator 2 specifically oh my god yeah yeah it's a great movie right and i and when i was a child like i would literally you know draw and paint so many you know pictures and come up with stories of what terminator could do and you know what kind of difficulties he would face and what other you know you know enemies and whatnot he he might have and you know there was funny thing at some point back then uh i i actually as a kid i i was thinking like to write a script for terminator 3 obviously back then nobody <laughs> even knew that you know third one and fourth one and whatnot would come yeah, up yeah. i started writing that as well but i don't know where where it is and if i ever could find it but that was kind of funny part so also like i i was that that was when i was a bit you know a little bit older i was a big fan of you know wrestling so i had my favorite you know characters and actors and you know wrestlers there and so i would also i would i would draw a lot of you know actions a lot of fights come up with you know different stories because the whole thing you know about wrestling like 
it's not only just the fight itself, but the stories, the ideas that they have. And, you know, being a fan, like I listen to, well, I used to rather, you know, lots of, you know, interviews when they kind of say like, you know, good wrestlers, they say like, well, it's good to be a good wrestler, but it also means to be, you know, creative, to come up with those stories, ideas, okay, how we twist it in the middle of the fight and how we, you know, kind of go go about it. So, and that that was also the part that I liked and I really, you know, was kind of like diving in and trying to figure out, oh, okay, this guy might fight with this guy. And I would kind of draw every like, you know, you know punch and how they jump and how they do all those kind of crazy things so that was really cool and i mean i guess you know what i'm trying to say is like you know drawing and painting when i was a child was more of a like a uh, means for me to express my feelings and, and, and you know what i felt about things that i was excited so so yeah and i guess still up to this day it's kind of same thing <laughs> kind of funny that you had the interest in wrestling because i remember that what window in town my brother and i we watched a ton of wrestling, uh, but I think maybe the heroes might have been a little bit different than um, your generation. Um, I think mine were like the old school guys like Jimmy Superfly Snooker and, mm -hmm. um, you know, Andre the Giant and <laughs> a bunch of other characters. I think uh, you might be from um, a little slightly, maybe the next generation of wrestlers. Well, I'm Hulk not sure. Hogan, you know, Hulk Hogan, Bret Hart was, was like, yeah, by far my, you know, best. <laughs> Bret Hart. He even had like saying the best there is, the best there was, the best there ever will be. And that was like, man, that's such a statement. I was like, that's it. <laughs> He's the best for real. Yeah. So when I was growing up, I mean, um, my dad, you know, obviously knew I liked to draw. And he, I did that on my own. He didn't even have to tell me about doing that. I just did it just because I did it. You know, it was my way, my little escape living in the Bronx, whatever. Uh, but he tried to kind of, you know, get me to do outside interests like Little League and the like. I mean, did you have any in parallel interests outside of drawing uh, mm -hmm. and your interests there that, you know, complemented what you did like uh, when you were younger or maybe when you were a teenager, maybe you mm -hmm. had some different differences? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, during my school school time, I also, you know, went to music school as well. So I studied there wow. for, yeah, eight years, like classic guitar and with electro guitar as well. Yeah, I had a lot of, you know, competitions and exams and tests and whatnot. So I, I was actually quite successful at that. And there later, I think, I don't know. And I mean, I was and I'm still is maybe not doing that much, but uh back then i was so much into like hip-hop and rap and all that you know cult culture i and you know it's still my favorite genre up to this day and uh so i was doing all sorts of things you know break dance like skating rollerblades graffiti and you know yeah like later as i was moving forward and probably because i also you know went to music school so I started producing music myself. So I was, uh, yeah, like, like, you know, the music, like writing lyrics and I had my own band and I even released some of the songs on a scale. Well, not, I mean, not that large of a scale, but let's say, I mean, back then I was in Russia. So it was kind of released for the whole country. But once again, not to say like it was such a big thing. It was more like, kind of, you know, for those guys who might be, into it so they you know they probably were able to find it so yeah that was kind of it and then then i started actually doing also psychedelic trends and i was actually you know kind of okay with that too so some of my tracks i would you know some djs in my hometown they played in the club so if you go to like psychedelic trance you know party so they would play it. and that 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 was really cool seeing how you know the crowd is kind of bouncing you know listening to your music that was really you know really really cool so yeah that was like yeah those times are great and exciting so i guess my question then because you had that visceral experience from seeing people respond to your uh, art via music mm. you know uh did that influence how you did visuals um or your work in any way or was that its own separate pathway parallel to you being a visual artist 
Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I mean, I guess like visual part of it never went away. I, I, I think, you know, as we kind of growing and moving forward, especially when you're a teenager, you're sort of, you know, trying to find your way, your path and what you want to do in life. And actually one, one great thing that I recently heard from someone, I mean, I think from one of the podcasts that I've been listening to, someone said, especially for teenagers, it might be great advice, like, Oftentimes, you know, we ask them, okay, what you want to be or who you want to be. But he said the actually the relevant question to ask is what kind of problems you want to solve in your life. And that might be a very good question to ask because sometimes it's hard to answer that question, like what you want to be or who you want to be. So maybe that one is actually a better one to kind of tackle it from different angle. But like I said, for me, so visual part never went away. And I was trying to figure out what I can do. And there at some point, you know, I didn't know that, you know, there is even such thing as digital art. And then I, I thought that, you know, listening to or hearing rather those stories that, you know, being being an artist is great, but, you know, most likely you're going to be poor for the rest of your life unless you're a super lucky guy. So obviously that wasn't something that, that I wanted, you know, being poor for the rest of, of the life. I mean, and then at some point I found out that there is such thing as Photoshop you know, while doing, you know, my music stuff and, you know, drawing like logo types for, you know, my band and for uh, some other ones too, I found out that there is Photoshop and I found that actually, uh, you know, the best, well, to me, the best work, it was like web design because, you know, you're using Photoshop, it's sort of like the tool where you can express yourself and do kind of similar things and you know kind of come up with the uh, designs and why web design is because uh back then the trend was that you can actually you know kind of create like image that would go to the top part of the website i think they call it like he a header or something like like that so it it, it was more like a visual style uh, that was kind of you know relevant back then I wasn't that much interested in, you know, making like UI or interfaces and things like that. But I think my sort of background and my passion for, you know, landscape art and art in general kind of was driving me towards that. And so, yeah, so that's how I kind of, you know, decided to, okay, that sounds like a cool thing. So let's learn Photoshop. So I started learning Photoshop and, uh, you know, eventually, I mean, my kind of goal was to get the job as a web designer. So and eventually I wow. got it. So, yeah, I mean, I didn't know better back, back then. So I got the job and I was happy for a while, you know, doing that. But again, there was something, you know, uh, something that I didn't feel was right for me. You know, once again, doing interface and maybe UI part, it felt less creative for me specifically because I wanted to do paintings, but I didn't know where I could apply it as much because for some sites it's relevant, for some not. And then I think it was uh, summer 2008, uh, just by accident, uh, like I stumbled upon one of the paintings on one of the forums that I don't think it, 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 it exists now, but. So the he, uh, you know the guy just posted like a bigger type of image that kind of had like a very nice well back then standards of that time very nice landscape and I was like man that's so cool and he said he did it in Photoshop and that was actually paid job I was like wow I I was really like blown away like that's it man I want to learn how how you do it and what and 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 like what for so and then you know. The great thing was that later on he posted also like a mini tutorial on how he did it. And I studied like back and forth like so many times, really trying to understand, you know, the like the things he used and everything to kind of learn, you know, how it all worked. And so yeah, I mean, and then I kind of you know realized that, you know, well, that's that thing is called map painting. And then I started doing my research. And I, yeah, I, I mean, I just got hooked, and uh, yeah, like since then, it, it it was sort of a thing for me. Would you consider him to be like uh, one of your first mentors? I guess you remember his name. Wow. Um, I guess when you're learning, because I know what it's like to kind of mm -hmm. just pull from a book on your own and then just start adopting things. Um, mm -hmm. So sometimes they function in that teaching capacity, uh, but I guess uh, the difference between picking up a couple of tips mm -hmm. and then someone who might be maybe an early mentor. I guess you could be mentored in different ways. You know, right. um, you know, I think uh, 
my favorite directors mentor me in storytelling. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that my favorite painters mentor me in composition. They don't have to be physically over my shoulder to do that. Right. But I think um, they work in your consciousness mm -hmm. um, to kind of influence the way you see the world and how that filters through you. So I, I guess my question is, who are your early mentors, so to speak, you know, in right. that way? Who are your influences? Right on. Yeah. I mean, yeah, what you said is totally like totally right and absolutely. Yeah. Makes sense. So, well, I mean, I guess the reason why I like his work so much is because, you know, early on, as I mentioned before, you know, I was exposed, you know, to traditional Russian art and I studied, you know, quite a bit of it. And, you know, uh, traditional artists like once again, you know, Ivan Shishkin, Ilya Repin and uh, Ivan I I Wazowski, they were like one of the biggest for me and they really formed you know for me what was a great art really like you, you know like a bar they set the bar for me and you know seeing the work that kind of you know speaks not necessarily to that quality but kind of resonates with you may, maybe on a similar level that was kind of it and I mean I wouldn't consider necessarily him as a mentor but I think he he sort of what was great about that specific moment that I realized that you can actually do what what I wanted to do for a living. So, and then I started to, you know, kind of digging in and finding what my painting was. And so I found, you know, such people as, you know, like mm -hmm. did, uh, Dylan Cole, Yannick Dusso, uh, and Chris Toski. So those, I think those three were like by far like the biggest influence on me. And so I found, that there, there was a platform uh Norman workshop so i bought all the dvds related to mapping and i watched them end endlessly like because quite often it's like you you're so excited you try to watch it and you kind of get the overall vibe but there are so many things especially when you learn so many things that you just can't you know embrace at once you kind of have to go back and you know rewatch it and i did it many times trying to understand it all and back and one of the unfortunate things was that my English was like zero. I couldn't speak English at all. So to me, it was just a visual understanding of what they're doing. So it was even harder for me, actually. But that, that's that's also maybe why I had to, you know, rewatch it so many times. And and yeah, I mean, those guys, they still up to this day, they like, you know, Yannick is like, I mean, Yannick, is so he's he's the best. I mean, at, at certain things like, you know. Do you have I, some samples of actually that you can share of some of your, your mentors, the influence? I don't know if that's something that you can readily get to, but. I mean, it'd be great for the audience to see who you're right. crediting as, you know, and it, there's so many different things that we pull from our mentors who, you know, live through their work. And um, so it'd just be interesting to see, yeah. you know, what you pulled from Dylan, what you pulled from some of these guys, you know, that were just critical in your learning, you know? Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah. And I, I, I think on this note, by the way, what you're saying is totally right. And I think what is important as well early on to sort of find those people you know who inspire you and try to learn from them as much as you can because yeah like you know you you can study basically just looking at their work sometimes it's not you know the most straightforward but definitely having that range or maybe find those like five people that you that you know that the work of you really you know admire and and yeah just like try to study them i think yannick's website is not loading but we can have a look at, at some of his work later so yeah i mean the, uh, obviously you know a lot of you guys probably know dylan cole but uh oh yeah, wow his work is yeah i mean back then for me it was just mind-blowing I, I mean i would watch it like i mean i i would go on his website every day and just like spend time just just trying to understand what is great about it like you know and obviously the way i mean some of his superpowers is you know as well as yanni uh, for instance is like you know using you know atmosphere and com composition and lighting and you know working with those shapes and how you distribute the shapes within the canvas how you how you guide the eye and things like that i mean those mm -hmm. are obviously some of the most important parts for me specifically mm -hmm. that's and that's why i i guess uh you know i i like these guys and that's why i guess i love landscape and that's why i kind of you know study that as well so so yeah i mean 
Dylan Cole wow. was, was his his work, and uh, I think I I think unfortunately I don't know what's happening with Yannick's website, but we, I have some samples here that I can probably bring up. Uh, there is a lot. I mean, what I like about Yannick as well is his concept art is so. I mean, it's so simple, but it's so solid. Like, I mean, this I I image is so great. Like, it's such a strong statement. A and I like that si sim simplicity. It's always like straightforward what he wants to say, but he's so brave and, you know, in in saying what he wants to say that I'm just like, wow, man, this, this guy is awesome. I've always been a big fan of artists uh, who know what details to lose. Oh, oh yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's one of those things where it's like I I'm 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 a detail. I love details in a painting, but I love the I love the right amount. I love yeah, exactly yeah. giving space to the eye, even almost imagining things. If you can invite me in, and I think that's what uh, that sort of peekaboo effect of some uh, who do it so masterfully, um, mm -hmm. you know. And it's nice to see uh, yeah. that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah, and by the way, in his work, like as you see, so this is. More, uh, this is a matte painting for Star Wars, so he can totally do all of that very, you know, precise, very, you know, polished, photorealistic. Quality. Yeah. But mm -hmm. he also can do, yeah, well, unfortunately, I don't have all of the works here, but he also can do, like I said, you know, conceptual. Oh, he, he'll go. So conceptual, uh, where right amount of details. It's not, it's not everywhere, and it's just he really guiding your eye, and this one is just mind-blowing. This is wow. So Cool. Yeah, like the lighting here is man. I mean, I was looking at this image. I remember for like, I mean, endlessly going back and like, man, how he did it. It's. I mean, even up to this day, it's just yeah. How do you compare the love you have for what you do now, mm -hmm. as an established matte painter, concept artist? How does that feel now when you're working compared to when you first started, and how do you keep it going? Is it by looking at other? people's work like we're doing now mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right yeah that's a good question too i think i think in general in general if you are a, a, an artist of any sort or any kind it's basically good to remember that you are a lifelong learner so it's always i mean you never done being a student it's always a matter of improving and moving forward and if at a, any point one thinks that you know he mastered it well i'm sorry that but that's that's the wrong thing to to do and to think uh so for me yeah it's definitely those painters who inspire me i mean some of the ones we already mentioned from traditional from russia mm -hmm. From yeah. Russian people like you know Shishkin and Ivazovsky, and definitely a lot from uh, uh, from American art as well. I mean, uh, like you know Scott uh, Scott Christensen, Clyde Aspovic, uh, Roy Lee is very very good painter. I really love his work. We can maybe bring it up very very quickly. Not not a lot of people know him, but he is he he is awesome. I mean, I love his work. Like he does lo those seascape paintings. Mm -hmm amazing i mean he's like i think chinese slash american painter but in his he is very kind of different style you mm -hmm. know it may be more like chunky in some areas and stuff like that but he finds the way man he's like yeah i mean i, that, I love his work really really cool yeah the, the the water the spray i feel you can feel the spray you know yeah. it's it's amazing the the movement that he creates with the static image yeah, exactly and i think that's pretty pretty phenomenal yeah yeah very impressionistic too so it's not necessarily all the time about those you know details but rather yeah like bold strokes nice precise strokes where necessary and then your brain fills it fills in the gaps basically it, i mean if we can call them gaps of course there but you know what i mean fills in information like yeah. with, with details okay so, yeah. So, so your mentors were kind of helping you create the uh, desire, the love for wanting to work digitally in this art space, in this area. Okay. Yeah. So, and you were working on your work. So, tell me about how you got into your what I consider to be your first big break in you know in working as either a concept artist or maybe even in the film business were they two separate things or did uh, was there one step that eventually got you into the other um 
with regards to your career in matte painting and concept? Right on. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, we we're gonna go back real quick. So that that happened when I was uh, you know working as web designer at a local studio and so then you know was i was sort of introduced to matte painting and i started to you know learn that kind of you know in my in in my free time rather you know after work you know maybe do some freelance and then maybe after freelance just like staying up the whole night learning how to do matte painting and that conceptual work too and uh yeah and i think it was let's see i think it was 2009 if i'm not mistaken or something like that maybe eight but i think nine so i bought like one of my well i yeah i bought my first you know tablet and i still have it here i mean i have different ones as well but i still have it here like that in two us three wacom so maybe some of you guys can still recall this kind of <laughs> old gray yes know, i do yeah yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> still have it. Still, and it works perfectly i mean not to sound like an old man <laughs> or whatever you know like they like to say oh back in the day it was so much better than now not to say or not to sound like that but some things really from back in the day they still really work fine <laughs> so well yeah. I, I i got a few years down you so you know it's funny to hear you say it at 31 because i mean i remember learning and picking up that same wacom uh, yeah. three tablet and um you know what it cost back then uh to get it they've oh, come yeah. down in, oh they've come down in price for sure for me it, it, it was that like you know buying that first wacom and then so i spent all my savings you know on that because you know the salary wasn't that big obviously and that's why i also had to do like freelance and stuff like that so i bought you know my wacom tablet and i actually you know i think it was like a winter holiday I think yeah. you know like new year and all that so my family and I, I i i mean my parents and i we went to like a park so i took a lot of photos of you know like uh pine trees you know covered with snow and things like that and i basically did one of my first sort of you know if we can call it map painting or you know maybe conceptual sort of il illustration rather i think that would be a better way of, of naming it and so I did that and I, you know, posted it on the mapping.org. And back then that website was a, such a big thing, like so many people, so many activities were there. So I posted it there on the forum. And usually the way it worked was that if your if your work is up to, to the level, so administration on the website, they would put it in the gallery, like specific dedicated section on the website where like, you know, sort of quote unquote best work would be, you know, published. Uh, yeah. by the fact it's also on the forum so and i was fortunate that my work was selected to be there and i was like oh man this is this is such a you know good thing right one of my first kind of you know work in that sense was kind of accepted by the big guy <laughs> big guys <laughs> well you know i was very happy and then and uh, and then yeah like i think you know someone from disney or from their representative somehow they were searching on that website to kind of find uh some of the paintings that would work for them i think and so and they got in touch you know with me and they asked me if i have you know the rights and you know the copyrights and psd and all that for that specific painting so i couldn't believe that that was happening like you know disney got in touch with me you know and they kind of you know want to know and learn a little bit more about my work so i told them that yeah you know it was my personal painting so i and yeah i i definitely have you know psd and all that so and eventually it worked out that i ended up selling the painting to them and uh, for like very good price i mean that was just insane for for me back then to earn so much from basically for me from nothing and then you know that painting ended up being uh printed on the billboard in the disneyland i don't really know which one it was maybe it's in paris oh well pro probably in us and it was it was there during the i think next uh, holiday season so so yeah that was a big thing for me and definitely a moment when I realized, well, man, you're probably doing the right thing. So there's a lot of things that concept art and matte painting share that are similar. And then there's things where it diverges, you know, where it changes. If I'm a student in your class, what is the problem I'm trying to solve? And how yeah. is that different as a matte painter compared to a concept artist? Yeah, 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 yeah. Very, very good question. And yeah, let's answer that. So basically, you know, 
to begin with. Uh, in conceptual work, the main purpose of that art um, is to, yeah, is to answer the question or to represent, you know, visual idea that either you or director or your supervisor or art director might have in mind. So it should answer that question. So sometimes the execution can be not necessarily the greatest. It doesn't always have to be photoreal. It doesn't always have to be super precise and whatnot. But as long as it, you know, it, it helps to solve the problem. Well, and of course, you know, by saying problem, we kind of, you know, exaggerating thing. But by solving the problem, you re you representing an image or a moving clip of some sort and whatnot. And as long as it helps to answer that question, that's it. So mapping is is actually a very different thing. It's a part of a shot, like a moving shot in in, in the movie, right? And map painting serves the purpose of a set extension and or enhancing something that is is there or not there. Or maybe, you know, you, uh, you, uh, usually, you know, the actors, they're shot in front of green screen or blue screen. Mm -hmm. And then we have to extend their, like the background. Like let, let's say for instance here, although it's from conceptual se section, but the idea is exactly the same. So they shot, against that blue screen and so and we can we have to kind of come up with a different background and that's for instance you know one of the versions of that background and yeah sometimes it can be as for the real like let's say as this one other times for conceptual work other times you know even a sketch like that can you know can basically tell you everything and then sometimes you show it to a director and then he says, "Yeah, that's that's basically it. That's what I want. So, yeah, you you know, you 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 you've got the right placement. You've got the right shapes. You know, the vibe and everything. So cool. And maybe he can ask you, okay, now let's bring it more to for the real quality. And then you do you know, like next pass, and you make it look like this. For instance, that might be the case. Sometimes even that can be enough. It all depends on the time frame." The, uh, depends what they want to get out of it, whether it's for movie, for a game and whatnot. There is a lot of different, you know, variables and aspects going into that. Uh, also for conceptual work, sometimes you might have to design, you know, certain things like spaceships, for, for instance, right? And maybe your job is to just do a design and that's it. So that, that might be other times you might do a design of a certain thing and then you have to put it in the context meaning like in the keyframe to sort of represent your design within, you know, within the context and, you know, possibly show it how that thing could look like in the shot, like mo moving shot in the movie, like retro sci-fi type of thing, like, mm -hmm. in and or real examples. I mean, those ones from, from the real project, as well as this one, I, I wanted to show you, for instance, what you can get as well. Sometimes like this is what I was given, which is like a screen grab from from you know Maya like Play Blast. Yeah. So that 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 was a, a kind of shot that is taking place in Shanghai, I think, in China. And so that's what they had like very rough kind of blocking and layout, and they wanted to represent it in the night. Uh, kind of type of lighting and all that. And they needed to have like a visual, you know, visual guideline in order for, for them to sort of have, you know, that visual uh, visual concept to rely on, you know, when, when they do lighting in 3D, when they, you know, do whatever, modeling, texturing and all those, you know, aspects. And then later in comp to sort of have something to rely on vi vi visually the reference. So I did that. Uh, I mean, I did this version based on that. So that's what I, that's what I got, that's what I did. And so this was a guideline for them and that using that the final shot uh became you know like that which is you know fairly close i mean it's never 100 percent the, the same but that painting served like a big big you know purpose for uh dictating how this shot uh would look like in the end and that's you know how how conceptual work and those keyframe and style frames influence the final output <clears throat> So for map painting, for instance, right? Like mm -hmm. I said, it's a very different thing, but the techniques may be, you know, exactly the same. So like, you know, she's against uh, blue screen and then we do like a, you know, kind of background enhancement and re re replacement. And this one, this one was done in the collaboration with, I think, yeah, here, 
with Dylan Cole and Milan Amaze. So I think some of this stuff from Dylan, some of this stuff was from uh, uh, department. Well, someone, someone did some of it at MPC and then I went on top and painted to kind of enhance it. So, so yeah, I mean, working at a studio as a net painter quite often, it's not like you're given most epic shot and you do it by yourself. Sometimes it might be the case. Other times it's a collaboration and teamwork. It might be the case, like for instance here. So this was what I, what I had, you know, kind of rough block out. And so that's what I did for the whole, you know, shot. So it, this is all like, you know, my painting work. The same for this shot as well. And that, that's really fun to work on these shots really, because you, you sort of have, you know, a bit of a, you know, kind of boundary so that you work within box that is this big, not that big, because when it's that big, it's great, but it also means you might, you know, go in the wrong direction. So some, sometimes that's fine. But once again, when, when the box is, you know, this big, it's kind of also fun to be creative within that little box and come up with the you know ideas and looks and you know whatnot so and it's really fun to work on you know such shots but like i said show dependent so you never know whether you're gonna have some of the some shots like that so so, mm -hmm. so that's sort of kind of the main i think difference and again in conceptual work it can be anything really it can be environments and it can be you know conceptual work for effects maybe you know he is about to teleport like this guy to transition to a different maybe a room or different part of the world and whatnot so we we have to come up with the effect of how he's gonna you know teleport so maybe it's some sort of you know kind of like spiral thingy that kind of like mm -hmm. in and whatnot and he's like uh you know transitioning through particles into it or i mean many different things as well what does collaboration look like on a film project um, as a concept artist? And how is it different uh, in working as a matte painter? The collaboration point, you know, I guess my question is like, how do you kind of work feedback both inside your department and outside the department uh, when you start kind of making decisions? What's that process like? Okay, yeah, so you know usually once again for let, let's start with conceptual and then talk talk about mapping so for conceptual work you know you would talk to either your art director or maybe production manager or maybe supervisor and they will tell you what they need for you know a specific shot or whatever that can be and so you know based on that you 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 know you kind of make sure that you understand the task and based on that you know you go to your workplace you do your research and then you come up with the images right and sometimes there are many many iterations because it's kind of hard to you know or they they don't even know what they want so and then plenty of versions so some for instance this was for godzilla right and that was ended up being approved a kind of keyframe or style frame for ice cover and a sequence of shots and then these are like if you look at the bottom these are like just the two of them of the versions how that painting was evolving and there were many like so many versions and there that's how it, that's that's how it kind of goes so you go through versions so then you submit it for review either to your art director at a studio or supervisor they will give you feedback maybe you have to change something so you do those you make those changes you submit it once again once they're happy they send it to the client supervisor for instance so then the client su supervisor might give you feedback as well so it goes back to you once again so you make those changes so your internal su supervisor approves it or not so then once he happy he's happy so we send it again to client supervisor once client supervisor is happy they show it to director and director might say that's awesome or he might say what is that <laughs> <laughs> and it might go all the way back to the very beginning after all of those iterations <laughs> <laughs> that's funny because you know you you say your job as a concept artist is to answer the question exactly with what you work and if he's coming back with more questions i'm like yeah well, that's yeah not the yeah. answer i was hoping to get <laughs> exactly. because uh, uh, you know everyone is different and you know sometimes those opinions they might not line up at all Sometimes they do, and that's great. Sometimes you kind of get it like, 
from the first go and that's awesome other times it takes literally maybe weeks you know to get that sort of look i mean it, it doesn't necessarily mean you work on, on only this one thing but i mean the the work on one kind of you know image or one asset or one design might take weeks some i mean it's always different so so yeah that would be more of a process for conceptual work so for matte painting type of work let's say you know, we can even, I don't know, let's talk about this one, for instance. So that's what you might be given, right? So this is the plate. That's how they shot it on location. So in obviously green screen specifically in there. So it's easier to key that person out and then, yeah. re, 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 you know, replace the whole bag, background. So they, they give it to you and knowing that, you know, the background will be replaced. So you actually go and do matte painting. And matte painting is... Uh, if you know that it's going to be a matte painting, so you treat it the same way. You're making sure that you're breaking everything down on layers. You respect the layer structure and things of that nature. And But you also understand that maybe first iteration or first version might not necessarily be final. So this this was from first iteration. But as you saw the other one, daytime, so it went through a couple, through, you know, a couple steps before we arrived at that final look. And so once again, you try to kind of keep that in mind, but maybe not necessarily invest 100% of your time into one version. So, and that's why we have daily review sometimes. So, I mean, it's great if you fast and you can produce maybe a couple of versions within a day or maybe more. Uh, I mean, it's not always the case, but you know, the faster you work, the better as well. But obviously that comes with experience too. So that that's one example. For instance, for this stuff, for this kind of work like that that may be something that you were given for instance right and then that's as far as 3d went but you have to make it look for the real so from the first glance it looks like well i'm in trouble man i have not i mean i have some rough geo in that so, like, so but then your to to like to 2d painting skills come in, into play so and then you know you convert that into that and that what goes on the on the screen so the same kind of idea goes here and these are like to to like uh, like establishing frames that I did that actually I, I I had a bit of freedom to sort of like even design them a little bit so I can lay layout pretty much stayed similar but I mean I changed a couple of things I kind of wanted to let it go into the distance and then come back to to the focal point and all of that sort of dictated how the rest of the sequence look like so basically stuff like that is kind of establishing map painting work so it's it's like like a concept in a sense that it uh, dictates the look but it's also map painting because it's used in the movie itself yeah. so hopefully that helps to explain it a little bit that's great and you know we've been getting a lot of questions and it's kind of coming in two areas uh, you started mm -hmm. to allude to the idea of speed um but i guess uh you know when you are working for your art director or your producers or you, whoever's kind of in the conversation how do you balance the needs of cost time and quality um or do you find that in a film environment they just you know is it more aggressive in terms of getting to final or um you know do you get the iteration time necessary to get what you need uh, accomplished yeah, it's a good question. I feel I feel like it depends as well. I mean, usually, usually from at least from what I found really happening at work is that for the first ideas, they would like to see kind of rather quicker or faster for the yeah. first ideas to kind of see that, uh, OK, so you understood what the task was about and then you are on the right track. And once they see that in those ideas, maybe rough ideas, once they see that in those ideas, there is potential, so they will tell you which ones, and then you might have a, a little bit more time to kind of flesh it out better. But the sooner you can, you know, represent those initial ideas, you know, the better. I mean, the same sort of goes for map painting as well, but I think map painting um, can be more straightforward in certain examples like for instance in this particular case the map painting is just about the sky and the trees in the background but you 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 wouldn't believe but it went through so many iterations for those trees like i mean you would say well it's fairly simple things stick the trees there and that's it but it's not like that quite often the little thing takes so long and you know many different artists might work so before i took over this one there was another artist and i think there was someone else there was 3d team so there were versions 
but like I said, it, like the best, if you can show the potential, you know, sooner and once they see, okay, that's cool. So maybe, you know, you show it next day or something like that. And usually we have like daily reviews and you kind of show your progress, at least if you work at a studio, that's, that's how it happens. If you do freelance, then you kind of manage your time maybe accordingly and kind of talk to your supervisors that way. I've been uh, noticing in the chat, there's been a couple of questions with regards to workflow, and I wanted to see if you were yeah. open to doing this. There was a question about working in Nuke. Do you have to do many projections on geometry in Nuke or mostly cards only? What is the amount of 3D work that you have to do versus 2D? And and when I say this, do you do the 3D stuff yourself? Are you like a ZBrush modeler or do you usually receive them? from you know the modeling department uh what is that like mm -hmm. okay yeah so first part of the question so 2d well i mean proje projections so it depends uh well sometimes you have to model some proxy geometry proxy meaning like simple geometry to be able to project things onto because if the geometry is too come you know too complex so it might be harder for Nuke to process and we, or, or might not, but I mean, it, it, it just doesn't make sense. The simpler geometry, the easier the pro, pro, uh, projection would go, but you also have to make sure that the cards or that geometry is placed in the appropriate place uh, according to the camera and things like that. So that's that's sort of what you might have to do yourself unless someone else did, did it for you. So sometimes you do it yourself, sometimes you might receive some a geometry from layout department and there yeah you can swap it with cards i mean whatever goes really there is no like, once again like clear answer but you know it it's always better whatever you work you do to keep it simple because if you have to change it it's just it just goes faster uh that's 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 about projections but as far as like 3d um it depends really uh if you are pure map painting artist uh, you might not necessarily do much of 3D, or you might do 3D uh, to a de degree that you are, you know, feeling comfortable. Or maybe, let's say, you know, you don't have specific element for your map painting, so you might have to render it. So, and for that, if there is an asset, you grab that asset and, you know, you maybe if there is textures, you apply them, or maybe you have to texture it yourself or, you know, and, all, and light it and render it. Maybe there is no asset and you kind of either have to model it yourself or find it somewhere, buy it, or I don't know, whatever goes. So just get the job done. That's that's one part of it. If you're an environment artist, then you have to do 3D yourself unless someone else does it in maybe build department and things like that. Maybe if you're a look dev artist, you're setting up shaders. So for conceptual work, uh, if there is no model, you you would have to do uh, stuff yourself. Like for, for 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 instance, like these creatures. So I model them, rather sculpt them, um, or for instance, I don't know. Let's see, like some spaceships. They also done in three D, uh, and uh, for instance, this one as well. So this is this was a sketch, right? So for me to understand how or where I want to take it. So that was a sketch. So from there, I looked a lot at references of some Indian architecture and similar things. And based yep. on that, I model or sculpt model, whatever you want to call it, or, you know, this kind of, you know, thing. So this is built of many different assets, like 10 or 11 pieces. And then, you know, these are two sketches. And then based on that, so I, I later took it to, you know, this sort of like final painting. And uh, this is also, once again, example of, or fin finish so concept art can, can be as polished and as that or can be less so yeah that's kind of amount of, of 3d sometimes you have to do do you have a preferred package that you like to work in uh well to me personally well for 2d obviously photoshop so for 3d uh it's been both it's been maya and blender uh maya because you know i have like heavy like vfx background and maya is the tool uh that every facility has and v-ray seems to be one as well uh blender is is the thing that i mean it's just i guess it's just easier to use and it has a lot of features as well it, it has some you know downsides as well if you if you go really large on a heavy scene you might you know you know you might benefit from using other software or like for set dressing for 3d for sculpting i use 3d code and uh yeah i mean 
other ones mm-hmm. would be more occasional ones like world machine or maybe das 3d and things like that so but those yeah. would be the primary ones yeah where do you get your assets from i mean are you like getting um them like when you're working as a concept artist do you buy models that uh, you don't have time to make yourself um or do you feel like you have enough 3d ability where it's worth your time to model it mm-hmm. sure well that that's also a good question i would answer it like that so depending on what your task is if your task is to design a spaceship and that's the that's the main the main goal so you of course you you i mean you wouldn't just go on kit bash 3d or something and download a model and put it there and call it a day that's not the way to to go about it so you would do your research uh, based on what director wants to see you know gather like maybe 2d references and images you might use some kit bash pieces that's that's okay just to speed up certain things but probably they want to see something u- unique from you right and then you would have to focus on actually creating that asset yourself once again you might use bits and pieces from kit bash and whatnot but predominantly i i i, I think they would like to see something unique from you. So you would make it from scratch. On the other hand, if you're working on a large, I don't know, cityscape or something like that, or maybe even, you know, keyframe, where your goal is to show overall image, maybe mood, lighting, composition, and stuff like that. So you're not paid and you don't have time to create unique assets. So whatever you can find to speed up your work, that would be the best. Yeah, so in short, that would be the answer to that question. So try to evaluate what's necessary and try to see how much time you have. But definitely don't focus on things that are not necessary. Don't don't waste your time on those. I want to know if you could tell our audience what is unique about the class you teach mm-hmm. and why your class is going to help students level up in their career. Uh, maybe you can speak to a little bit about what they can look forward to based on what you've been sharing and showing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So yeah, the class is like, you know, what everything that, that I showed and, you know, talked about to, to the, uh, today, we, we kind of go way more in, you know, in depth in, 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 in the class. So the class is basically de- uh, designed for both for conceptual artists and for map painters, because like I said, there are lots of techniques that overlap as far as, you know, pr- producing images. So if you want to do great, like beautiful keyframes or style frames, there is everything that you need to know in the class. And I will guide you through and help you with the feedback. If you want to become a matte painter in the industry, there is everything you need to know in the class. I will also guide you and help you. There is like 3D part, there is projection part, there is a part that helps you uh, in assembling the final shot and all, you know, all those good things in, in, in there. And I think, like I said, unique part, about it is that because I've been working in visual effects for quite a while now, and I've been, you know, working in map painting department slash environment department and in art department as well. So I kind of know both ends and what is expected from both ends. And uh, so whereas maybe, you know, uh, some other classes might not necessarily give you that. They might be heavily driven on technical aspects and maybe not necessarily on artistic aspects or vice versa. So in this particular class, there is this and that. And like I said, since I, I've been working in both and I know how it works, I will be able to help you with that. Yeah. So what kind of feedback can they look forward to getting from you? Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, there is like weekly or like one, one once a week, there is a feedback on the work. So. Each week there is a certain, you know, certain content dedicated to to the uh, to the class. By the end of the class, you are supposed to have at least three. Well, I mean, this is like what you have to have, like three paintings ready to like a kind of realistic quality for real quality. Uh, also, if you have time, there are optional tasks and in, in, in assignment. Basically, the more time you have, the you know, the more you will gain. You will gain, and there is also a portion of the class dedicated to creating final shots. So if you if you have time and you can completely dedicate, you know, sort of yourself to, to the class, you will have like free paintings ready. You will have optional paintings uh, that are necessary, like set extension, some, some, something that you would 
expect to get as a net near. You would have final shots, which is also great because even if you want to be, you know, conceptual artists, sometimes they want to break down your concept on pieces and then maybe do like a quick kind of projection to kind of have a bit of an illusion of moving uh, elements in there. So I, like I said, there, there, there are lots of things that overlap and I will help you with the feedback from artistic point of view and from, you know, technical point of view, whatever like question you might have, I will be there to, to you know, to guide you and help you. I was going to ask a little bit about the question of feedback, as you know, in all parts of life, whether it's your art, you know, your personal life, professional yeah. life, uh, you know, if you're going to live in the planet and do something that involves other people, uh, there's always going to be the question of people's responses. Uh, we call the word feedback. Some people call it criticism. Some people call it um, development. There's a lot of fancy words for it. You know, yeah. what should my attitude be about feedback as an artist uh, first in mm -hmm. showing my work? And where should my mindset be when it comes to growing? Right. Well, it's not, I guess it's not necessarily for the classes, just in general, right? Yeah. I mean, because we have to deal with it all the time. I mean, yeah. do you get some tough feedback from uh, your clients? Maybe it's not the ones you were hoping for. Or you know, how do you like make that distinction between um, not taking things as personal as sometimes it can feel because you put so much love mm -hmm. and heart into your work? That's a good question. It, it's like, as someone said before, I can't remember now who was that, but the he said like the first impression when when we get feedback that we did not hope for would be like oh no this is wrong you know like your your first impression would be negative but i i see what i mean so usually the best thing i guess is to try to enjoy the process i mean don't necessarily think that this is your final image like you know that you have to put you know that you have to like i don't know treat like well this is my baby this is just the work and they pay you for your vision for your idea for your eye and then the best way like i said is just enjoy the process and put your love and your heart into the process of creating it and yes yeah, sometimes there will be moments when when it just doesn't line up with what they think and that and that's okay you kind of have to separate yourself from from that you know i guess from that kind kind of final output at work because it's not necessarily your own it just you know it's a team effort and you have to un understand that but at the same time just you know do like do your best and you know try to convey that message but don't take it too personally i know it's kind of hard and i guess there is no direct answer that would answer it 100 percent. but i think like i said enjoy the process and don't really take it too personally when you do work for a client because even they might change their mind really they 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 were they thought that was what they wanted then they saw it and then oh okay that's good but that's actually not what i want or maybe they had a dream at night and next morning they want to change everything that really happened a few times so it's not necessarily always your fault it might be circumstances mm -hmm. no that's good so it sounds like keeping an open mind yeah. uh you know understanding that you know unless it's your work, you know, someone else is paying for your services and exactly. finding a way to kind of give yourself your best, but uh, take yourself out of that so that you don't personalize the feedback and uh, you just see, enjoy the fun in making the changes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. But yeah, the process, a apply your best skills and knowledge to making the image, but don't feel like, you know, if it, you know, if they don't approve it, don't feel it's always your fault. It it it, it just circumstances. Tim had uh, a question with regards to uh, the intertwining of concept art and matte painting, but from a career perspective, mm -hmm. do you think it's easier to get into concept art or matte painting, or is that you know is there even such a question of easier or is it just different, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's a that's a good one. It's kind of hard to answer straight away. I mean, well, I think there are, you know, these days specifically, it looks like 
uh, it's kind of cool to do, you know, conceptual work. And it's very popular. Like map painting was like that, I, I think like 10 years ago, e everyone wanted to be a map painter. And now it seems to be with concept art. I mean, that seems to be the case. I think it's equally, I, I mean, it might be equally hard to get your first job because, you know, people don't know you. It's hard for them to trust, especially if you don't have that sort of experience in the in, in, in the industry right but once you get that first job and then you you know you can sort of prove that you you know you're hard working you dedicated person you're driven you do your best no matter what and then once they see that I, I you know they either keep you if if they have enough job or you know it's later for you to find you know next job afterwards but it might be a bit challenging to to get that first one whether one is easy than the other, I don't know. It's kind of, I, I mean, it's it's hard to say. It's just a matter of circumstances, really, as well. Sometimes there are many projects and they need like specific people with specific skills for that specific tasks. And they are looking for, you know, map painters. Other times they might not have, or the show may be that very heavily driven on 3D work and they don't necessarily need, you know, map painters, specifically map painters. They might look for environment artists, you know. And then with with uh, with concept art, um, working in visual effects at a studio, uh, it might be, they might not look as often to work in-house at a visual effects studio because, you know, concept art, we usually work, you know, kind of fast and we usually able to work on a few things at a time and juggle things and stuff like that. So they might not necessarily look as often, but that's also, there are exceptions in that case too as well. There might be, you know, lineup of projects and they really need a bunch of people. So, yeah, I mean, I think both might be easy. It may be hard sometimes, but I, I advice would be just uh, go with your feelings, go with your heart, like ask yourself what, what you would like to do and put your all the effort into that and the sooner or later that that will happen as long as you stay persistent it will happen yeah, yeah i think there's a also um a concern i guess um i know that the, there's a question about can a concept artist work remotely i mean it's happening all the time now covid has definitely uh changed the way a lot of us work now yeah. uh, so i think the answer on that part is yes i think the bigger question is is it harder to get known just from your presence online as opposed to like maybe more in person? Obviously, if you're starting off, most likely you don't know, you know, anybody. And sometimes, to be honest, like, yes, it's great to promote yourself, especially on social media, art station and whatnot. So especially if you're looking for more like freelance work. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely, def that's definitely a great way of doing that. And I was doing so similar things when I was like starting off uh, for freelance. That would help. It it also great thing to reach out to people who work at a studio where you would like to work. But be before doing that, make sure that your portfolio is up to the quality. Because if you just you know send them high you know email hello email but you 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 really have nothing to, you know to contribute or to say uh there is that there i mean it, it just doesn't make sense there there is no point in it so try to try to if you do that try to make sure there is a certain question there is certain target and your work is up to the quality and maybe get in touch with them like let's see maybe there is an opening at a studio right now there and you feel like okay maybe i am good enough maybe not i'm not sure but maybe it, it's good to talk to someone there to get that feedback or even in general just you know get get in touch with them and ask for feedback don't don't do it too often because you know that also might be too annoying and you know people are busy but get in touch and ask for feedback that's a that's a great thing because sometimes i can tell you that a lot of people they're very big on art station and things like that. But uh, people who work in the industry on the highest level, they might not even have art station. They might not even, or they might have it and they have like thousands of followers and that's it. They just don't have time to post images there. They don't have time for that social promotion things. They're just busy on what they do and they they commit completely to that. And so that 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 might be the way to get in touch with them just to kind of hit them up directly with email 
or some or message or something like that. So I mean, once again, art station great, but it's not the end. So. And, yeah, I noticed that a lot of people who are like my generation who kind of maybe started in the transition from analog to digital, um, you know, a lot of them don't have websites still. <laughs> it's yeah. shocking, actually. Um, but they've maintained the work reputation, which just gets the repeat call all the time. And uh, because they've built that within the industry. So I think the the industry cred goes probably further <laughs> you know yeah, no, you, no, yeah definitely knowing but it, and respect goes farther for sure yeah mm -hmm. yeah and it just it's just hard to break through that i call the membrane when you're looking from the outside in uh when you're first getting started and i think you know some people are in different places on that journey uh which is awesome you know at, at cgma because we have so many different classes to offer people depending on where they are in their artistic learning curve. We had a question um, about like uh, using world generation uh, software. Can you walk us a little bit through like where that would be appropriate in some of your work? Well, this particular image, this terrain was generated in world machine. So then I grabbed, uh, grabbed the mesh from world machine, brought it into Maya. And I also grabbed like slope maps and height maps and all the maps that I needed to generate or rather to scatter those uh, proxy trees on top. So as you can see, they're scattered not everywhere, but just yeah. on the planes or faces that are facing up and in specific areas. So that's that's some of the things that you can get from, from you know, those packages like uh, World Machine or World Creator or Gaia or wh whatever else. And I mean, um, those, you know, those packages, it's not like you, you use them every day or something. They are not like uh, mandatory, so to speak, you know, to, to know. you If you know it, great. If not, then, you know, maybe you can get away with something else. Or maybe you can learn it once you need it. Because, you know, I don't use World Machine on daily basis. So now if I need to do something, I would also probably, you know, try to kind of read refresh the brain in, 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 in you know in, in that sense of okay what notes do what i mean i still re remember obviously you know how the logic works behind it but certain things i i might not remember because it, it's been a while right so the yeah. same the same applies for all the other you know secondary software pieces uh you just kind of you know uh, learn them as you go and use them where needed but what's more important is you is develop your critical eye and your understanding of what makes for a good image. And, you know, obviously, of course, you know, 3D, like the, you know, the basics, how to model, how to texture, how to light it and things like that. And of course, if you go in conceptual work or maybe even in mapping, no, they don't expect you to do like look depth quality for your shaders. It's not even necessary because in conceptual work, it's more about bigger shapes and bigger picture rather than smaller things and smaller, you know, features in look depth, for instance. So it's a little bit different approach and mindset depending on what you do. But yeah, that would be how I used a word machine for this particular project. And uh, in general, so I, I think I gave like a thought of how it works in general. That's great. Yeah. And it's nice to see it's, uh, because, you know, there's so many different tools um, that are out there that you could easily go down the rabbit hole. Yeah. But I guess it's like learning as much as you need for the assignment and thinking, you know, it's it's worth investing a little time to get the results of what you just showed. Uh, and that becomes a good anchor for making, um, you know, a really great either matte painting or finished concept or, yeah. or concept piece. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, just try to be lo lo like logical, right? If you know World Machine so well, but you don't really know Photoshop or don't know what makes for a good image, then, well, you might be hired to do like T-Rains for a couple months or weeks, and that's it because you don't know anything else. But most likely Photoshop alone would give you farther than that. I mean, oh, and once again, it depends what you want to do. So I can speak for everyone and for every situation. Every task is different. Every job is different so there is i mean so don't quote me on that uh, like all the time but i mean in, in in general like you know the basics are what you have to know for sure like 
really well and the rest is kind of you know you kind of learn it as you go yeah um what expectations as a student let's say i'm a student right now about getting a job in such a competitive work environment how should that guide my efforts in building my portfolio or my reel okay so if you are a student who wants to take my class for instance or you know artist who wants to level up and Either way. So I think the best would be, of course, you know, the, like if you're already familiar, you know, with Photoshop and 3D tools, it would be, you know, better for you to gain more from the class, you know, because, you know, I can give you, you know, feed, feed, feedback and then, you know, you follow, you know, the progress. And then if you already have the foundation, you, you're just going to get more from the class because, you know the foundation is stronger and you can brush up on new things or i mean brush up on the things you know and learn new things right versus uh there is nothing wrong if you completely new as well so i will guide you through you know the whole process and everything really and you will learn those things as well so basically uh if you already know the tools great you will just you know move on you know faster and be able to complete more tasks because like i said there are optional ones Right, so that's that would be great for you in that sense. If you're more of a new uh, artist or student, then yeah, like you you will be able to do at least three paintings by the end of the class, and I will help you to you know to get there and guide you through, and you will see the like the whole process. Because also in the class, I have uh, examples not just you know of work that I created for the class, but also the work I did for real projects. And I show you the whole process of how it works, which is great, I think, as well, to have a bit of an insight. So for those who, like, finish the workshop and all that, so, yeah, like, the best uh, the best thing would be to really, like, be honest with yourself, have that critical eye, try to de develop that critical eye, and have, like, it from five to ten pieces, really best ones. Be super honest with yourself. Take 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 like take the time to to get that work done. Those ten pieces. Maybe it will take you thirty pieces or forty pieces to select ten or five even, right? And then you send them, or maybe you make your show reel based on that, you know, with camera projection and, and whatnot. Once again, depending on where you want to be in the end. But the idea is to show your best work, and it will take time to get those best pieces ready. But once you once they they are ready, first and foremost, you will you 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 learn quite a bit by doing that, and then you send them to your uh, you know to to like to the company, and then they will have a look, and they will they they will see that every work, every piece is strong because if you send five pieces, or rather you send ten pieces, and five of them are good, but five of them like okay, you know, kind of you know so so. And someone else says uh, sends five pieces or five paintings, right? And they are like all amazing. So most likely they will hire the one with five amazing paintings. Although in the end they both might be equal, but that guy who sent five, he just sent like really the best work. He didn't show any weakness, you know, basically because they will always judge you by your weakest piece, you know, and. Like I said, they they might be equal, but that's the reality of how it works. Yeah. Sounds so, like the I hate to say it, this uh, there's a definitely survival of the fittest when it comes right, to uh, right. the work. Uh, yeah. There's a lot in common with um, what we do in the arts and uh, sports. <laughs> it's in, in a lot of ways, you know, very yeah. performance driven. To that end, I mean, and for those who are interested, um, I know um, Igor's class is considered to be. Um, an advanced class, but, um, you know, we do have prior classes at CGMA to kind of set you up on our painting 2d painting track, uh, as well in case, uh, there are questions about that as well. So you can always go on our website in case you need to kind of look at that if that's where you are, uh, cause there may be some beginners, people who are genuinely interested in what you want. They see what you do is amazing, but then it looks like there's this big tall mountain that they have to climb to get to it. Hmm. Um, you know, I don't know what it was like for you, if, if you can remember what it was like when you were first starting out, like, did it come easy for you uh, in the beginning? What were the things that kind of were your challenges when you were first starting out as an artist? Oh, well, I mean, I wouldn't say it was e easy. Like, I think, you know, the 
I was a bit lucky in a sense that, you know, I, I got to work with Disney and I got to work with National Ge uh, Ge Ge Geographic, sorry, <clears throat> at, at, the early, at the very early, you know, stages of my career as a map painter or conceptual artist. So I was fortunate in that sense. But uh, was it easy? No, I don't think it was easy because, like I said, you know, I had to learn it on my own, just looking at a bunch of tutorials and staying up all the night until like 4, 4 a.m. sometimes and then be at 9 a.m. at work, work the whole day, you know, get back from work, have a dinner, maybe have maybe do freelance or maybe not, depending, it, 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 you know, if I had one and then kind of keep learning. So that's what it was. And then I I participated in a lot of challenges as well, because, you know, challenge would be, you know, they have like a specific theme or subject, and then, you know, you have to complete the work within the boundaries given. That really also helps you to have those boundaries and, and have the time frame as well. Because if you don't have it, if you're not disciplined enough, you know, it might linger for a while or you might give up or whatever. But if you have like a goal or target, then it's always good. And uh, yeah, I mean, especially at the beginning, you kind of have to commit and spend your free time doing this stuff. If you, I mean, if you really want to be good, especially nowadays, there is so much. I mean, and it's hard to embrace everything. So for that, I would, re you know, reiterate once again, Decide what you want to do, whether it's this or that. And at the beginning, just focus on that one thing. Try to try to get good at it. And then as you go, you will expand and branch out more. So mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, looking back on your career, what, if anything, would you do differently with regards to how you started the training? Anything that, um, you know, because I know uh, you had a unique path. You know, living in Russia, you mm -hmm. know, started artistically, creatively. Uh, you became a musician. You studied musician. Uh, and then you found the art again. Yeah. And then you went on from there. Was there a point where you would say, would you have done anything differently? Uh, yeah, it's a it's a hard one, to, 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 to be honest. Because, I mean, who knows who... who I would be a what I would be, you know, in that in you know in those circumstances. I think the way it goes is probably fine. I think, uh, you know, advice for myself and for everyone else. Well, I mean, that's what I've been following. Just be honest with yourself, and then try to listen to yourself and uh, go where it takes you, as far as you know your passion and things like that. Because I feel like it's better to try it. And then, well, if you fail, well, fine. At least, you know, after a while, you will look back and, you know, you will not regret that you didn't try it, right? Because, mm -hmm. because if you don't try it, it's, there is always going to be something, you know, behind telling you, well, you know, you were afraid or scared, you know. And I, I know this industry might look like that for some people because it, it's so overwhelming and it, it's, you know, it's always changing and evolving and things like that. So I think that would be, Kind of the thing that I would probably, you know, mention. But regarding overall path, I think I, I think it all went the way it should. It it should maybe just learn more art if you if you can. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's really good because it's all related. Yeah. Who are you looking at now uh, these days, or um, are you still looking at the the old uh, masters of the past? I know you do uh, some shows, by the way, right? You do some uh, traditional painting. You said you were doing oils. Um, lately um and doing some shows yeah yeah i mean i'm a member of a federation of canadian artists and you know quite often they have shows there so mm -hmm. like say the show would be dedicated to like a specific subject it might be landscapes from the west or maybe you know the title maybe you know concept or you know anything or maybe something that it, i mean if i feel like it's re related to paintings that i do uh then definitely i would submit and you guys can get familiar with that over here in the traditional se se sections you can see you know a lot of traditional art that i do so the, these are like studio paintings and uh there are i mean you will have a chance i guess to have a look later and then um uh, i think this this was pretty big like meter or something and these are like plein air paintings like they usually done outdoors on location or maybe even indoors based on some studies that they did outdoors so yeah i mean if something related to that 
I mean, I would send it to the gallery and then, you know, if it gets accepted, great. So then it's on the show, like part, part of the show and, you know, it might get sold. Uh, and yeah, definitely looking at great painters of the past and modern painters as well, like modern ones. I mean, there are so many, like, I mean, to name a few, like Matt Smith, Mark Borges, like Richard Schmidt, Scott Christensen is one of my favorite. I, in fact, I attended his workshop, so I studied with him quite a bit and still learning from him a lot. Glide Aspedic, you know, Russians that we mentioned as well. Saroya, I mean, Sergeant, I mean, man, my list goes, goes on and on. Yeah, Sergeant's one of my favorites. I was actually thinking the the wave stuff that you're doing uh, with the uh, the ocean stuff is um, uh, just definitely hearkening a lot of Homer and Sargent. Uh, yeah. It almost feels like um, when you paint your personal work, it's like there's no strings. <laughs> you know, there's no strings on me. Like you're, you're free, like Pinocchio, where it's like you're not having to worry about a client. You're just painting for yeah. pleasure, and yeah, it, uh, it shows mm -hmm. in the work. Yeah, yeah, that that's that's definitely what it is. I mean, some people like I don't know. I mean, I like hiking and whatever. You know, whatever can get get your mind off of things. Great. So to me, paintings painting is somewhat like that. It just also has advantage because you're also practicing at the same time. You're not thinking it, it, it about computer and digital and your client and whatever. You just going into it. Yes, you focused you totally into it, especially if you paint outdoors, it's very challenging with changing light and weather conditions. But you are, you're, you're doing different things, but great thing because it also helps you to become a better artist. So, and that's why I kind of keep, keep, you know, keep up doing that, you know. Well, I love that. And especially in the age of COVID where, you know, they're trying to, you know, keep us, you know, you know, just sequestered more or whatever. I think it's great to just get out there even more. And it's nice to see this. I, I just, I feel the ocean spray. Uh, mm -hmm. I smell the ocean. Um, you know, I think we need to get out more often and take our creative skills in into the environment and, and just let that inspiration wash over us. These are right. I mean, and, and it's such a, you know, it's the reason why I still do figure drawing. Uh, it's the reason why you paint, you know, because, you know, Outside of it being a job, it's still something that it looks like you still have a lot of love for. And uh, I think um, probably, uh, would you say this work helps you kind of mitigate, you know, maybe the feelings of burnout from working in the industry? Uh, it probably does. Yeah. Because, you know, like I love doing art, right? I mean, I, I, I want to do it like all the time if I can, but I don't want to sit in front of computer all the time. Although sometimes I have to. And it yeah. maybe the client work, or maybe it's a uh, my personal work that I want to do in digital medium, right? So sometimes that's that's the case. And to today, to, to tomorrow, I will probably work in digitally the whole the whole day and tomorrow as well. But anyways, but that helps kind of yeah, like you know, still still produce art, but not being like you know constrained with just the digital media. And I think that's great. And it also, I think, helps you to put your brain to a different kind of di uh, dimension, maybe, if that makes sense. Kind of look at it slightly differently and look at, look at it at, as a simplest way, because in digital, quite often we get carried away with details and, you know, things like that. But here, I don't necessarily focus too much on painting every branch every leap or every tweak i'm i'm going for big shapes big statements and decisions you know compositions and lighting that's what i love and that's what i love practicing you know and that these paintings they definitely all about it like compositions shapes distribution of shapes lighting shadow you know arrangement lighting how how i want to guide the eye and things like that so all of that comes into play when you're like in front of the blank canvas and that's pretty that's pretty scary i mean a, a lot of people who might want to just try it when in front of blank canvas you you're facing so many difficulties you don't have color picker you don't have tra ah. tracing ability you have nothing you have you have that wood stick with the hair you know, <laughs> with the hair at the at the bottom or the top whatever and then you have yeah. a white canvas or maybe a tinted one. So, and you just have to kind of do something with it. So yeah, it's, it's a bit of a challenge. May, it might be stressful for some, but like I said, don't 
stress too much over it and have fun with it. Most important part, no matter what you do, digital or traditional, have fun with it. I'm not feeling the stress. I'm feeling the windblown feeling in my short little hair balding. <laughs> it's, it's awesome. No, these are great. Um, and I think it's great for our uh, attendees to see this side to you too, to know that uh, one thing feeds the other. And, um, you know, this just only makes you a better artist overall. And um, so we're, we're really excited to see the side to what you do. But I just want to say thank you, um, Igor, for spending this hour and a half. I want to say thank you, attendees, for your questions, for being engaged. And on behalf of CGMA, I personally thank you uh, for this time to get to know you a little bit better.